My name is Carla, and I love to tinker with electronics and sensors and robotics. And uh, this first project that you're going to see uses um, RFID tags. And uh, what I was doing was playing with the tags, and I inserted them inside these spheres. And when the spheres are placed inside the sculpture, they change the sound in the room. So people entering the room can pick up the balls and can play any three mixes of uh, ambient sounds in the room. Uh, another thing I've been playing around with is capacitive sensing, kind of like what you have on the screen of your smartphone. And in this project called the Lickestra, which was a collaboration with food designer Emily Baltz, uh, what happens is that the entire interface is operated by licking. And participants are part of an orchestra, so their tongues are the thing that triggers the music. You could see a little piece of it. I lead a lab at a firm called Smart Design that's called the Smart Interaction Lab. And we've been experimenting with connected objects and the Internet of Things. So in this project, there's a box that a person can keep on their desk in order to kind of express their state of mind. So you can turn the top of the box and change a color. And you know, red might say, I'm really busy right now. Or you might say, I'm up for brainstorming if you change it to blue. Or I'm um, red and available to take lunch. And it can be seen across the room, but because it's an internet-connected device, it can also broadcast that status online. So people in offices in other parts of the world can see it. And then um, yet another project that the lab has done is an apron alert. And what we wanted to do is explore wearables and connected devices in the kitchen. So this is an apron that tweets. When you undo the clasp, it will let um, people know that cooking is done and is ready and on the table when you put the apron away. But uh, let me just take a step back and explain why I do all this madness. Um, I'm a product designer, and I work on things like cell phones and vacuum cleaners and uh, connected washing machines. And I started as a mechanical engineer but I eventually shifted to design because I realized that what was important for me was the emotional connection that we have to objects and you know, what those experiences are. And in order to really kind of explore those experiences, I use stories. So stories for me are what I call reality plus emotion. It's what exists and then I add how I feel about it. So an example of this, uh, I wrote an article for the New York Times about how robots is, are going to change our everyday objects. Um, this is Simon, who you see here, who uh, is a robot that was created by a team that I was part of at the Georgia Tech Socially Intelligent Machines Lab. It has cameras for eyes and microphone ears, and it's able to gesture and interact with people in a really social way. And for me, what I was excited about is what the implication that this would have for our everyday objects. And in order to get the point across um, and how I really felt emotionally about this vision and how it would affect the future, uh, I worked with the New York Times to create a really fun video. But stories work on two levels. One is emotional. So I get people to really care about what I'm talking about. Because if you show them objects and circuit boards, you really can't get people to care. And then once you've hooked them, uh, stories work on an intellectual level. So they really kind of are a vehicle to help get the nuts and bolts across. So a couple of years ago, uh, what I was thinking about for the future that would really make an impact were affordable 3D printers. I'd used very expensive ones in my professional work, and I could see with the DIY movement, with MakerBot and similar inexpensive 3D printers, it was going to change everything. And I really had to do something about it. So the first thing I thought was I would do a piece of a book or an essay about you know, design and distribution models and um, you know, how it was going to change economics. Um, but then I realized I really had to get my hands dirty. And what I wanted to do was um, think about how I could be making. And then it occurred to me a way that I could both write and make. And what I decided to do was create a storybook that includes 3D printed objects as part of the story. 
and the objects would be things that would be available to people uh, online so that just as the character in the book has a physical object that's produced as part of the story, so does the reader. And my hope is that when that reader grows up, they'll cherish these objects as a memory of what they learned through the story and discovered about 3D printing in this really exciting time. And so the story is about a young woman named Carla who thought she couldn't do anything creative until this one day that she meets a robot, a 3D printing robot with a heated nozzle and a tray, and his name is Leo. And Leo asks her to draw me a sheep, which is my homage to Little Prince, which was a book that really influenced my creative life. So she reluctantly obliges, and then he takes his tail and his tray, and he spins up a sheep. And voila, the next thing you know, she has a physical sheep in her hands that Leo had created from the drawing that was only in her mind. <laughs> and then the story goes on, and I use the book as a way to talk about many possible futures. We might have 3D printed food, we might have 3D printers in our homes. When I spoke to experts, that's what I realized is that we have some guesses, but we don't know for sure. So uh, one of the characters is named Stephanie, and Stephanie is a jewelry designer, and she works with her ro robot, Hi-Ho, to uh, create jewelry for her customers, and she has kind of a micro factory. So instead of depending on a factory, she actually can produce the jewelry and send it to her customer herself. Um, this is made with the Shapeways service, which is 3D printing, but readers can also print it in plastic in their homes. Another example of a character in the book is named Nathan. And Nathan is a young boy who lives by the beach in Coney Island in New York City. And he loves to walk on the beach and explore. And he works with his robot, Iris 7, who has scanners as part of her anatomy to scan his feet and make a shoe that perfectly fits him and also lets him leave a special kind of footprint. This is an octopus print. So his friends know where he's been on the beach. So the story goes on and on, and there are many other characters that have these future scenarios. But the main characters themselves can also be downloaded and 3D printed. So um, we have Carla and Leo. So what's been happening, the book's been out since December, and it's traveled all over the world, and then objects are materializing along with it. Uh, the objects have shown up in classrooms in Iowa, in children's homes in Ireland, in teachers' conferences in Russia, in maker spaces in Shanghai, and the list goes on and on. These are just a few snapshots of some of the things that readers have made. And then what's also really cool and kind of surprising is that people have been printing the objects from my fiction, making them real, and then the, turning them into their own new stories to use them for different purposes purposes. So, for example, this is a less innocent version of the sheep that I have. And if you look in the background, there's something a little nefarious going on. And um, this is a photo by a teacher in Virginia who goes by Design Make Teach online. And he uses the characters to uh, get across certain points that he's trying to teach. So here he's teaching about the 3D printing process, and he explains that Leo not only prints in plastic, but he also prints in snow. And here, Carla is learning about the gears in the 3D printer and how the 3D printing mechanisms work in the X, Y, and Z axis. But recently, I got an email from Dundee, Scotland that really kind of blew my mind. And the email said, hello, we are the first library in the UK to have a 3D printer, and we got your book, and we've been printing the objects. Thank you for making so many well-designed objects and such an engaging story. And they also included a link to the courier.co.uk, which had an article, and the article said, in this particular library, they are using the book with visually impaired and blind children, so that as they read the story, the children can actually touch the characters, and they can suddenly have the same experience or a great experience, like kids who see illustrations. As you can imagine, this really 
made my day and really warmed my heart and just surprised me. And it's something that I hadn't even considered as what I had intended to do with the book. So you know, when this happened, I said to myself, oh, I really have to do more. I really want to keep going making physical open source objects that can be distributed around the world to inspire people to learn and discover. But as a designer, I can't just make objects that are not meaningful because they're a novelty and they're a technology, and because technologies come and go. So I've been thinking a lot about what makes objects meaningful. And there are very personal reasons. Um, you know, one of the things is objects that remind us of people that we care about or know. For example, this is a t-shirt that I made for a friend of mine who um, was suffering with cancer, and he and his wife loved my dog, Roo. So to bring them some comfort, I drew this t-shirt. So in addition to it reminding me of my friends, it's also meaningful to me because it's something I put into effort into making. Um, and actually, this uh, necklace is something that I made specially for the TEDx Bangalore, um, as something that would remind me of today and my experience with you all. Another thing that makes objects meaningful is having them be a memory of a time and place. When I was a young girl, I was on the subway with my father, again coming from Coney Island. And there was a stranger across the way who had clearly won a stuffed animal dog. And my father pointed to it and he said, you see, Carla, that's the St. Bernard. The St. Bernard saves people who are trapped in the cold. He has a barrel under his chin and it's filled with whiskey. And he went on and on. And when the stranger got to his stop, the doors opened, but he actually turned to me and he said, here, you should have this. And let me tell you, I had that dog so many years until it was tattered. It was an object that I really loved and cherished. And I really believed in the mythology of the St. Bernard. So these kind of emotional connections are the things that I really hope to get across in new objects that I can make and inspire people to make. I wonder, could I take what I did with the Leo book and bring even other kinds of learning into the picture in a way that people can explore and feel an emotional connection? If somebody gets to know Stephanie, will they have a memory of Stephanie that they care about? If they go along for the journey with Stephanie's struggles with mathematics and formulas for spirals, and then the reader makes their own struggle and makes something that's special for them, will that be meaningful? Or if the reader takes Nathan's shoe and makes their own footprint, will it be a source of pride and a source of identity? So these are some of the questions that I really want to find out. And so I'm creating a project called Together We Make, in which I'm looking at these ideas of open source objects. So for example, maybe we have Sana, who is learning about electricity and looking at solar panels. So she's tinkering and as she's learning, you might have a kit or have instructions of where to get a kit so that you're also going through the process with her. And she wants to make a lantern for her parents' garden so that they can spend more time out there at night. So maybe you can have Sana's lantern and it's meaningful to you, or maybe you make the shell for your own lantern shade. Or maybe we have Rahul and Omar, his, a dog that he's created that's a little plastic dog. And uh, Omar has uh, news inside of him, so it has a little thermal printer. And it can be programmed to give Rahul information about robots every day, a little printout. So could my readers have a news dog of their own and they can customize the shell and they can customize the printout so that it gives them information about skateboards or sharks or like a friend of mine did happiness. I wonder, and there are so many open source projects already out there from solar lights to functioning robots. Um, so it seems like there's really far we can go with the idea of books and stories. So I'm really excited and wondering and what might it be like for a child who makes a lamp so that her parents can see in the dark? Or a child who brings an internet connected object to the classroom to give them information about what they're learning that week? And so my challenge to all of you today is 
to look inside yourselves and find that spirit of creativity and think to yourself, what's a project that you would like to make? And think about all the tools that are available to you today, from electronics prototyping kits to 3D printers that we never had before, that would enable us to make things. And especially those of you who didn't think you were creative, I want you to think, what's that project that you would like to make? And what I'd love you to do is to tweet. There is a, a Twitter handle for Together We Make, Together underscore We Make, or you can hashtag it to me. And let me know what your thoughts are and your dreams are and your ideas for the things that are meaningful to you that you would like to make. And let's share those ideas with each other and with the world. Thank you.